I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Hey, aloha, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you here this evening. As you can see, I've got my buddy over here, uh, Mr. Tim Coville from uh, Gumshoe Stories. Uh, Tim, how are you, buddy? Doing well, Chris. Glad to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you here. We're excited that you're here to, to shed some light on a, a really interesting case that, you know, we've been following. And, uh, you know, I know you've been instrumental for about five years of, of really tracking this very, very carefully. And, and so I wanted to have you on tonight and I really appreciate you taking your time out from your family and, uh, you know, let everybody know about your YouTube channel. You're over there, you know, tell us a little bit about, uh, Tim and about your YouTube channel. And then I'm going to reach over to our mods and our family, uh, our family here at uh, the interview room and just kind of say hi to some folks. So tell us a little bit about Tim. Yeah, um, my name's Tim Koval, and Gumshoe Stories is my YouTube channel, <laughs> and I've uh, been following the case for five years, uh, since the very beginning, really, since the, like, the morning after the murder, when I turned on the TV and saw it on the Today Show, uh, the footage of a SWAT uh, police officer appearing person walking through the church, and was just uh, sort of captivated by that, and uh, horrified by it as well, so... Um, just kind of began to follow the case and talk to other people who were following it and um, went down a rabbit hole. And here we are five years later. Well, I'll tell you, you're you're humble, too, because uh, I've looked at some of your stuff. And quite frankly, uh, I think it's pretty extensive. And and you really have a lot of factual information. And, and guys and gals, if you get when you get a chance uh, at the end of this, I he he's almost at a thousand subscribers so let's get tim well over that mark by the time we're done here this evening if you can uh it's called gumshoe stories over there but also link down to the bottom he's got his website uh link down there get over to his website and he's got missy's case uh pretty rock solid in terms of copies of search warrants and a variety of other information and that's why i wanted him here tonight to just kind of go over uh, you know, uh, do a deeper dive uh, from our first time to where we are today. So uh, I want to say hi to some of our um, community members here and ask you if you haven't had a chance to subscribe uh, to to the interview room, please, you know, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell. Uh, so when we do go live, uh, then uh, you'll get those notifications. We're grateful for all of our members uh, that are here. Uh, if you're not a member, that's okay. Uh, I'm one of these guys that, you know, will love you and uh, no matter what. So, you know, please, if you if you uh, uh, are new to our channel, please consider uh, subscribing. So I want to say hi to 12 Step Woman. It's great to have you back. Miss Sophia and uh, Mimi J2 are mods. Uh, man, I'll tell you, we could not do this without you uh, folks. Uh, we sure we certainly do appreciate you. Maui girl. Aloha. My flock. It's great to see you again, my friend. I know down in San Diego, uh, uh, we're, we're going to say hi and give you a shout out there. Uh, Charlotte D., let's see here. Barb, it's great to see you tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Rochelle, Sean, it's great to have you here this evening as well. And Judy, Darlene Jordo, Karen, uh, Gillette, uh, my Karen, I see her in here. You know, Canada's in the house. J JL, uh, Dorothy from Colorado. Hi, Dorothy from Nebraska. We got Animal Lover. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, man, we've got everybody in the house here tonight. They're from all over the world. We are, we've got, we've got a great family here. I'm telling you, we've got uh, folks from uh, Sophie H. Great to see you as well. Uh, Australia from uh, Europe, from Germany, from Iceland, uh, South Africa. Uh, just everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Anne from Wisconsin. Great to have you here this evening. Uh, Ms. Shoreland and VM Doss. This is perfect. Great. Leah Braun, great. So, oh, here's where here's where I want to go here tonight. Yeah, you guys know my style, um, and Tim, I'll just kind of, uh, if you haven't had a chance to watch any of uh, our stuff, I'm and Portugal's in the house. Hi, Sophia, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Ripley, Ohio. Whoop whoop, Carrie, go. Uh, I was just on the, in, in a meeting today with uh, Dayton, Ohio, today with those guys. DFW, Kimberly's in the house. Where I go, uh, and Tim is, is, I really just want to stick with the, you know, factual information. And as I went down and started doing my research, you know, from my side of the house, uh, I when I came across your website and I came across the some of the work that you're doing, I just thought I got to be honest with you, you know, kudos to you, buddy. Kudos to you. Just how how did you compile all of this uh, data that you got into here? Well, not by myself, certainly. Um, I've, mm -hmm. you know, worked with a number of other people, collaborators. Um, I consider myself, you know, having two goals. One is to be the case documenter of this case, to just kind of help everyone keep on the same path and not get derailed in terms of what we know, what we think we know, and what we still don't know. And then, uh, and, and then the number two thing as far as, why I'm here is, you know, to ultimately solve this thing and uh, and see justice for Missy because her family deserves that. Yeah, absolutely. I, that there can't be a greater motivation from you, buddy. And and I I commend you and applaud you for that. And uh, we've got a lot of people here, also Tim and Peggy from Canada. I just want to point out that as folks start coming in here, uh, we you we really can make a difference for her uh, case and for her family. But my the primary, primarily the reason we can is when folks like you stick to the facts. And, you know, as the old dragnet says, just the facts, okay? And that's what I saw when I started looking into what you've, you have compiled. So, and I see Patricia just subscribed to Gumshoes. There you go, buddy. Keep, woo, 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 way, way to go, way to go, Pat. Thank you so much. Uh, Jojo, hi, how are you? Okay, so let's, uh, Dylan, let's let's do a couple of things. Let's pull the church, um, um, what a schematic, right? Basically, uh, that you put together, uh, Tim, right? Yeah. A layout it's, of the it's church? A layout of all the rooms and... Uh, a number okay. of people have worked on it to the point that I'm 99.9% .9 sure that it is accurate. Okay, perfect. So let, let's do a couple of things here. Number one, let's let's go backwards. And uh, I just want to refresh everybody. The last, the last video we did on her case, on Missy's case, was we went over, okay, the suspicious activity at the nearby sporting goods store. Okay. And we saw the car that had come through the parking lot. And just like, you know, last time, guys and gals, towards the end of uh, our, our, you know, opportunity here meeting together, uh, chime in. We, you know, we'll take questions. Tim can answer them. I'll answer them. But what we're doing is uh, getting accurate information about, you know, the who, what, when, where's, and why. So the question was on the last one. Uh, is that suspect or subject or whoever that person or persons are, okay, are they connected to the church okay, and and Missy's uh, case? So Worcester Mass, good to see you here. Uh, and so, so the question then to my mind is, okay, well, we have to have a proper timeline. So let's uh, go over a couple of things about the church. So tonight we wanna focus on the church. OK, and so as you can see in this map here that Tim has uh, eloquently prepared, uh, this is kind of a layout of the building. Okay? 
And Tim, so with that, let's let's go ahead and walk walk us through uh, this layout. And how did you get how did you get this information? Number one, in terms of how did you compile it, and is this an accurate assessment of uh, the church where Missy uh, um, was killed? Okay. Uh, early on in the investigation, uh, I was spending most of my time working on the website Web Sleuths with some other people who were following the case. And there were some individuals who got um, blueprints, who got uh, information from the tax office, um, schematics that allowed allowed them to uh, to get a good idea of you know, how these rooms were structured, um, you know, and there were photographs that were online taken inside the church that uh, gave clues as to what was where. And uh, and then there were what I would call undercover operatives who <laughs> actually went into the church uh, on on Sunday morning or whatever and, uh, and, and were able to be the eyes on the ground, boots on the ground people to, to verify some of this information. So this is... Um, to to every to my knowledge, a hundred percent accurate as a layout. Okay, so this is this is pretty cool because this now gives us uh, a schematic into the building. And I've noticed here that you also have arrows and you have uh, movements of the subject in the building. Is that correct? Would that be accurate? Yes. Yes. Uh, we have we have arrows that. Uh, kind of denote what is shown on the video of the suspect's movements. Okay, so one of the things, let, let's start with, you know, where the suspect was outside of the building, okay? Mm -hmm. And then at some point, there's a point of entry, right? A POE, okay? So right. walk us through that point of entry from uh, your uh, investigation so far in terms of what you've come up with. Okay. So room seven up top in the center, which is kind of lavender colored on the layout, this is the kitchen. And there is a door on the, the left side of room seven from the exterior that is a metal service door. And that is the door that the suspect is believed to have entered. And this is what police have told us. Okay, uh, can you, one, one other request, Tim, one of our viewers can, he wants to know if you could turn your volume up a little. They're having a, a tough time. Yeah, no problem. Okay. okay, let me let me try to talk a little bit louder. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So so the, the suspect enters the room seven from the metal service door and spends an unknown amount of time in room seven. So two things we do not know the answer to are when did the suspect enter through that service door and how long did they spend in that room? What we do know is that at some point they traveled from room seven to room eight, the interior of room eight, and then they emerged from room eight into the hallway. And that's when we know that there's a timestamp of 3.50 a.m. because that's when they're first seen on camera at 3.50 okay. a.m. Okay, so let's take a note of that, right? 3.50 a.m. is the first time that the subject in the building is seen correct correct hey so if we correlate that back to potentially the sporting goods store you had a conversation you and i talked the other day about is the timestamp correct on that surveillance video at the store one of the questions we were talking about remember was if they hadn't changed it for daylight savings time that would actually account for an hour potentially, right? So what, what did you discover, uh, if anything, uh, from the last time we communicated? Um, that's still an open question. I did reach out to some sources about that, and I haven't heard back yet. So um, it is it is possible that the timestamp was not accurate at SWFA. I guess it's also possible that the timestamp at the church isn't accurate, but we haven't okay. been told, you know, we haven't been told that, that it's not accurate. Okay, so we still, I, I think you would agree, that car can't be eliminated just yet. Would you agree? 
I would agree. I mean, it's it's coincidental, but it's mm-hmm. not next door, um, and mm-hmm. there is a time gap. So it's it's something that we can't really eliminate, but we can't say it's a sure thing either. Okay. Okay, well done. So uh, let's look now between room seven and room eight. There is a door, and room eight is, uh, according to yours, is the cafeteria, correct? Yes, there would be tables and chairs, and the people got their food from the kitchen, and then they they uh, ate and visited in the Connections Cafe room eight. Okay, uh, wonderful. And how does the suspect uh, get through that north uh, kitchen delivery door? How does the suspect actually gain entry? Do they use tools to get in there? They do. Uh, that door is a metal door with a latch on it, but it also has a vertical window. And that vertical, that vertical window was broken in. So um, from what police told us, uh, it appears that they may have made some attempt to pry into it but then they broke out the glass and just reached in and opened the door that way. So that's an interesting piece of this puzzle, because if we start thinking about the mindset of the perpetrator, that's to the north side of the building. Okay? And this suspect is banging on that door. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely banging on the glass for sure because they're breaking okay. it. Okay. And I've seen some pictures of that door and I saw that they actually severed off the the handle. Uh, well actually the, I actually have some question about that because what we don't know is if police discovered that handle that way or if okay. during their CSI maybe they removed that handle to okay. test it for evidence. So we don't yeah. really know for sure. Yeah, though, and they may have taken it for sure, uh, but you can see the scraping uh, on the door, and which would be consistent with a pry bar that we see show up inside of the video. Okay, not saying that it is at this point, right? But it certainly would be consistent that if a subject, uh, you know, is getting frustrated from that position, that they break the door and reach in and try to pull the latch mechanism. Uh, which is not an uncommon um, thing to do, right? Um, right. It, it, so suspect gets now into room number seven. What's the second X over on the right there? You have uh, the first X. Uh, Dylan, can you zoom in a little bit more on room number seven for us? There you go. Yeah, zoom in right there. Keep going. All right. So can every, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, give give me a one if everybody uh, can see this clearly. OK. Uh, and that way, as Tim is walking us through this. OK. All right. We're looking like we're doing good here. So that second X over on the right. Uh, Tim, tell me. Tell us about that. What is this? That is a window that uh, the suspect did some damage to. It has a, a screen on the outside of it. And there's one photo that you can find online uh, that shows that screen was bent, kind of twisted and bent as if they were trying to pry the window off or pry under it. Um, and I'm not sure if there's glass on the interior of that as the next layer of window, but that, that screen was definitely damaged. Okay. So you have two potential points of entries, at least attempts at gaining entry into this building uh, in uh, there at room number seven. In your in your uh, investigating this case, or at least covering this case, have you found any other points of entries or attempted points of entries in the in this building? There's one other. If you go around to the northeast, that entrance that says northeast entry, those doors were damaged. You see at the right corner and then just coming down a little bit. So that's the porch where where I was the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago, the porch in the corner up there with the two X's. 
Yeah, come on, come over to the right a little because I can't really see it on your screen there. Yeah, keep going. Now you're there. Now you're there. Okay. Yeah, see those two X's? Yes. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. Where you climbed that staircase in your video, yep. uh, or, or pointed out that staircase, um, they boarded up with plywood those doors. And um, so they were damaged. Uh, we don't know whether, you know, the glass was broken out or broken in. Police didn't really talk much about that area over there, but there was damage there. So your points of damage are the kitchen door where the suspect presumably entered and then that window where the frame was bent and then the northeast entrance doors. Okay, so it it, it sounds like that door, some the windows at least in that door are busted out. Are they both the exterior and the interior windows? Or just the exterior, if you know. Do not know. Okay. But we do know that they the exterior windows were boarded up. Correct. Okay. So you have one, two, three, potentially four uh, uh, possible points of entry. Would that be accurate? Yes. And in this... It seems the most plausible then is room number seven. Uh, can can the suspect get into room number eight if they came through that northeast entry without going on camera? No, because as soon as they emerge into the hallway going in through that entrance, there are there are two cameras there. So okay, uh, okay, so, yeah. show show up. Uh, uh, there's a possible mindset here is the suspect comes to that northeast entrance, breaks the breaks the window, hypothetically, and then observes potentially, is there a camera at the other end, at the uh, the west end of that hallway, focusing on those northeast entrance doors? Go from to the what, top. From what I have found from sources, I've been told that there were cameras in every corner. Okay. We only have footage, though, from the northeast and from the southwest. Okay, so it's possible, then, that the suspect also observes that camera and decides to go to another point of entry, which would be that kitchen door. So the question is, what is the sequence to points of entry? Okay, uh, does, it, it sounds, it, it would be more plausible that the suspect chose that northeast entrance as a first attempted entry. Something spooked him or her or it or whoever it is at this point. And then they went over to that north entrance, tried that first window, uh, that first X that you have, and then pounded on the door and subsequently made it into the building. Okay. That is just, you know, a, a, a theory at this point. But mm -hmm. I'm curious as to why the suspect didn't go into that northeast entrance. And we, we can get to that uh, in, in a little bit here. So now the suspect's in room number seven, which is the kitchen. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And it looks like they make it into room number eight. Yeah, through and, that interior door that separates room seven from room eight. So they... They went from the kitchen into the Connections Cafe, and they still were not out in the hallway and still not on camera yet at that point. Okay. So walk us through what happens next. Okay. So there are two doors from room eight uh, into the hallway. The suspect emerges from the door that is on the western side of room eight. Uh, so where you see those three arrows on the layout, that's the door. Um, the door of that room that's furthest away from the camera because the camera is mounted right above the entrance. So this is when the suspect is first seen on camera at 3.50 a.m., emerging from room eight, turning to their right, and then running their hand down the wall as they walk west. So in the, the video that we see, and we're going to play that in a little bit, is that camera behind the suspect? or is it frontal to the suspect? 
the camera is behind the suspect. Okay. So that would be uh, away from that point of entry. And that suspect's being picked up by that northeast corner. And then it sounds like there's something uh, on the north side, uh, the, excuse me, the northwest side as well, that would pick up the suspect coming towards the camera. Is that accurate? From what I've been told, yes, there should they there should be a footage that has not been released that would have okay. shown the suspect as long as it was working that night. Okay, so the first time on video, what's the timestamp at the church for uh, this subject coming out of room eight? It's three fifty at three fifty a.m. Okay, so zero three fifty in the morning. This is the first time that subject is seen going into the hallway in that church, in that building. Okay? Correct. But we know the suspect's lingering outside to try to make entry into the building. Okay? So we don't know what that time frame is, uh, but it would be probably significant to bang on that door for at least five minutes. Okay, maybe. Okay, I, and uh, that's a guesstimate, obviously, but... You know, if we just use a little common sense here, you, you got to bang on the door to get in. But before you even do that, you're going to bang on two other doors. Okay. And then you're going to go around the side of the building and try to pull a screen off and get in through a window. Okay. Which also now you have to think about why is the suspect pulling the screen off to try to make entry through a window? Okay. And, do, well, and the other the point to bring up about that window, Chris, is that that window yeah. is fairly high off the ground. That, mm -hmm. um, and I know you've you've been to that property. I don't know um, how much time you spent there, but the property kind of slopes down as it moves toward the back of the church, you know, eastward. Uh -huh. So, yep. um, so as you get, you know, further down toward the back, they, you know, they have the foundation of the church, and it's it's higher up off the ground. And so those windows are not windows that you could easily just crawl into. You'd have to really hoist yourself up. And then that's why the entrances on the back end have staircases because they're, they're so high up off the ground at that point. But that window, you know, it would not have been easy for someone to climb in through that window. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's leveraged off a lot of theories, right? And a lot of speculation about, is this, you know, being, is this suspect looking to, you know, stage, uh, you know, a burglary and entry or, you know, something to that effect. And the first couple of places, you know, doors and windows, et cetera, could play into that theory uh, in, in, in that mindset. Right. But right. so without going down that rabbit hole yet, let, let's stay with, and, and by the way, I, again, I have to commend you, Tim, you have absolutely done a fantastic job of really paying attention to minutia details. And, you know, guys and gals, if you have not gone over to Gumshoe, uh, you know, stories yet and hit that subscribe button at, at the end of tonight's show, I, I think you will. Uh, it, it, this guy is really sharp. He's, he's very, very good. And Thank so you. now we go down the hallway okay, and it's 0350 is the first timestamp the suspect is seen. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Walk us to what happens next. Whoops. Walk us to what happens next. Well, from the video standpoint, there's kind of a jump. And that jump goes around to where the arrows are in front of room two. Okay. So, so let's go down there, Dale. So we, we don't have footage of what might have happened with room six or room five or room four or room three uh, or the main entrance area, which is uh, also called the west entrance. But where the video picks up that was released to us, uh, the suspect is at room two. Okay. And Thank you, Jenny. Go ahead. And, uh, and the suspect then goes down to what isn't really a room. It's more of a closet, a janitorial closet, which is designated as one. And that's where the suspect tries to pry into that door because it's locked. And they 
try for a few minutes and then give up. So what is the timestamp on the video at room two, if we know? Actually, we do know um, because one of the first video clips that was released to the media in the day or so after the murder did have a timestamp on it. It was a short, like, seven-second clip, but the timestamp was around 3.58. So, okay, so... So eight minutes between between emerging into the hallway at room eight and then coming around to uh, room two and room one. Okay, so the suspects in that building, uh, if we hypothesize here from 0350 at room eight, headed in a westerly direction, potentially, because that film has not been uh, released, right? Okay? The suspect then turns in a southern direct, southerly direction, and we don't know if, do you have any knowledge of any of these other rooms, uh, you know, three, four, five, if there's any indication that those rooms had any disturbance? We don't know. Um, I, I can okay. tell you that uh, room th three is really just a, like a little indoor playground for uh, okay. small children. Okay. Uh, and then rooms four and five are adult classrooms. Okay. So those are basically just, um, just empty rooms, basically, right? Maybe chairs, uh, maybe a table, you know, maybe some Bibles, maybe a whiteboard or an easel, something like that. Okay. So tell us about room two. Is this the one with the double door on it, the, the barn door? No, no, that is that's actually room twenty one. Uh, okay. Room two, yeah, room two is uh, also known as Cubs Corner, and there okay. are um, there are basically three doors into Cubs Corner. One you'll see is uh, kind of a black rectangle that is right there where the entrance is. When you see the okay. word porch, right under the word yes. porch, you see that black triangle. That's a yes, little sir. alcove. Uh, that, and I've got on my YouTube channel, I've got a little bit of uh, footage of that kind of a glare okay. when you're trying to take a photo at night uh, from outside the church, but you can kind of see that alcove, uh, which would be a good hiding place, by the way, if someone wanted to hide there. But that's, that's one way to get into room two. And then um, just off the hallway, you've got two entrances. Okay, so what does the what does the subject do at room number two, if we know? We don't know. We just see the suspect opening that southernmost door and looking inside briefly, maybe stepping inside briefly, and then uh, emerging back into the hallway and turning their attention to uh, that closet number one, which is just a janitorial closet, and uh, starting to pry into it. Is this the part of the video where it appears there's a pry tool of some sort that is utilized uh, against that door? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and and are we at zero three fifty eight still? Uh, but at this time frame on the timestamp. Eight is I either think. the point. It's either the point where uh, the suspect is in front of room one trying to pry, or it's as they walk on to room 21 from there, but right around 358. Okay, so we've got eight minutes potentially uh, from around the back of the building to the front of the building. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yes. Okay, so... Now, what? Tell us what what happens in room number twenty one. What 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 takes place here? Well, the suspect leaves uh, their attempt to pry into closet one, which seemed like it was a half hearted attempt, and they walk across the field of view of the camera. But they turn their their face to the left, and if you'll see that brown rectangle down almost in the corner, that is like a coffee kiosk that has sort of a strange little. Um, sliding louvered door that that you can 
uh, pull across that kiosk area, I guess, to lock it up and secure it. And it was locked and secured, but the suspect looked toward that as they walked uh, closest to the camera. So they were either interested in that or else they were deliberately trying to hide their face from the camera since they were at the closest point to the camera at that point. And that's something I've just begun to think about recently after seeing it for five years. I just always okay. assumed that they were just looking at holy grounds with interest and thinking about what might be behind there. But, you know, perhaps maybe they were trying to avoid the camera because there's a point when they're trying to pry into room one where they look directly at the camera and make eye contact uh, with, with okay. the camera. So, but anyway, after they walk across the field of view of the camera, they then start up that southernmost hallway and uh, then the camera view switches to the other camera that's pointing eastward down that hallway. And you Okay, so, be, yeah, let me ask you a quick question before you, okay. before you go. Yeah, that's fine. I, I appreciate it. Uh, before we go down that east hallway, is it the southern camera go, pointing north that gets the suspect at door number one, or is it the uh, northern camera pointing south? That gets the suspect. It's the southern camera pointing north that catches them at room one. Okay. It, so, it, it is a it is a camera that's mounted above the entrance. Okay, so it sounds like the 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 video management system, they call it a VMS, right? It sounds like the VMS system is configured, okay, for hall coverage with a camera in front of the porch or in front of over the entrance that you're saying, uh, pointing in a northerly direction. It sounds like there's a camera on the west side at the end, down by room number five, pointed in an easterly direction. Then I'm gonna assume at the southeast corner, and you correct me uh, if you know, by room number 16, that camera is going to be pointed in a north direction as well. Do, do we know that? I, I only know that sources who would be pretty good sources who should know have told me that there were cameras at every corner. And, okay. and, we, know, and we know that there are two cameras at the north east and we know there are two cameras at the southwest so okay there are either one or two cameras at the other ends the other corners and if they're like the the two that we know of then there would be two cameras so they're doing this basically they're covering both sides of the hallway at at each of the four what we'll just call it the four intersections right the southeast northeast etc okay uh does that sound accurate if you know yes that's accurate okay so basically they have video coverage in in these main corridors uh and, that, pretty, and that's the well. only place they have coverage that they don't have cameras in rooms you know because okay. of privacy they don't have cameras in their auditorium because of you know because of privacy. So really the intent is just to cover the hallways and only the hallways, and which would also cover the entrances as well. Okay, beautiful. Dale, uh, let's zoom in again over by where uh, Tim left us off here. Let's go back uh, up towards room number 21 down on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, if you can zoom into that. Yeah, uh, Jojo said this case would benefit from a 3D reenactment. Do you know if there's been a 3D reenactment uh, of this particular building? Not that you I know. know of. Not that I know okay. of. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Hopefully somebody in the PD will pick up on that, Jojo. Good good thought. Okay, so we're over at room number 21. Uh, and so tell us what uh, happens next in, in your research. Yeah, Route 21 has a split door, also known as a Dutch door, where the bottom mm -hmm. and the top halves are independent of one another. Mm -hmm. And we see the suspect walk up to this door and reach toward the, the bottom door handle. And of course, only the bottom door opens. 
So then the suspect appears to be surprised by this. They kind of tilt their head back and look at the top door and how it has remained in place. And then they open up the top door and okay. they briefly step inside to that room. And then they proceed further up that hallway. Okay. And room number 21, what, what is that called? Under three? So there's really not much there. It's kind of like the nursery. What, that's exactly, right? Yeah, that's I mean, exactly right. Nurseries have that type of door so that they can leave yeah. the bottom closed and keep the kids from slipping out, but they can still um, yeah. pass, pass kids back and forth and communicate with parents and whatnot. Yeah, th those little rascals are like herding cats on, on yes. every Sunday, right? The gotta love them. Okay, so tell us, uh, what's next? What do we got? Room number 20. Tell Walk me through that. Yeah, the suspect goes to the next room uh, and, you know, we see them briefly at that room. And, uh, and then they proceed to room 19, which is actually the offices. And there's a kind of, I've, I've seen some footage in front of uh, the offices where there's some glass uh, and then doors that open. So that's uh, a little bit different looking than the, the other rooms that are just normal, uh, normal metal doors. Um, but the suspect does kind of disappear into those office areas. And then we see them pop back up and they're walking back toward the camera from there. Now, this may be a little hard to follow, so try to try to track me here on this. I believe that this is out of sequence when the suspect pops back up and is walking back toward the camera because it doesn't make sense that the suspect who has been proceeding systematically in a counterclockwise way around the church would just turn around and come back without completing the perimeter tour that he or she is on, right? Because uh, room 19, um, they're still all the way down to the end and then all the way up that easternmost hallway with uh, rooms 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, and they haven't explored that yet if, if they really turned around at that point and came back toward the camera. So I don't believe they doubled back. Mm -hmm. I believe what happened is... Oops. We just lost him. Um, well, he's going to come back on. Um, so everybody hang on with us here. He'll be right back here. Uh, while we're waiting for him, what do you think so far? Wait, let's uh, put a couple of thoughts up. What have, we, what have we got going here? Oops. <laughs> she says, oops. Exactly. He'll, he'll pick up. He'll come right back here in a minute. But uh, let's go over some, uh, some thoughts. Um, uh, Sophie, maybe he knew where he was going and didn't need to go through the entire building. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're definitely, we're exploring that, right? Our, you know, this is kind of, uh, this is getting uh, pretty interesting because, you know, I've read a lot of different things about whether or not the offices, uh, you know, were targets uh, and, uh, you know, what the situation was there. Uh, but it looks like he, uh, the subject uh, went to uh, the room, uh, room number 19. And that, I was just getting ready to ask him, is that the pastor's offices? Uh, Dwight Morning, thank you so much for that kind donation. Let me see if I can get uh, Tim back up here. It looks like he was having a little uh, internet issue. I'm sure he'll be here in a sec. Um, so anyway, I thought that was an interesting piece uh, of this puzzle. Uh, wonder if they had a safe. Wishing B, we're about ready to find out. We're going to find out if he knows, um, you know, this, let's find out. But yeah, if he, if, if there was, you know, re remember I was telling Tim, I was talking to Tim before uh, we started our broadcast tonight. One of the things that I mentioned to him was there's two types of mindsets here, right? <clears throat> when you're talking about a commercial burglar, Okay. They're much different than a residential burglar. Okay. Those guys and gals, they think much different. They think way different than one another. You know, your, your commercial burglar is much more meticulous. They take their time. You know, they're looking for high value target sets, i.e., you know, gold, jewelry, money, uh, computers, anything that they can move quickly. Okay. 
your residential burglars, you know, typically, you know, they can run anywhere from teenagers to, you know, 20, 30. Uh, but a lot of those guys are trying to support habits and or for if they're younger, uh, they're into curiosity. Uh, and if they really become a professional, then quite frankly, uh, they get into more sadistic uh, types of crime, like, uh, you know, sex, sex, uh, sexual deviance behavior. So, Timmy, it's great to have you back, buddy. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Don't My worry phone about died. It. My phone hey. died. And so now I'm, <laughs> now I'm not using the headphones anymore. So hopefully hey, you can hey. hear me. You're awesome. Uh, we have a great family here. Nanamo, thank you so much for that donation. You're so sweet. We have a great family here. We're very patient, and we're glad you're back. So we were just getting into room number 19, and and we had the question, Did do you know if the suspect had, or the offices, did the offices have safes, or did they keep, you know, valuables in there in the pastor's no, I, offices i can tell you that this church did not keep their tithes and offerings on site when they took okay. those tithes and offerings on sundays they immediately took them and deposited them okay so they did collect on sunday though they did and that and, and of course a suspect would not necessarily know because some churches might very well keep their tithes and offerings and not take them to the bank until the next day. Okay, so those offices, what? how did the suspect gain entry uh, in, into those offices? And Dill, let's, let's uh, zoom back into room number 22 uh, or 21. We were just there. MH, uh, Zar, thank you. Well, wow. Just what a, what a very kind uh, consideration and donation, but I can't thank you enough. You're, we really appreciate it. Uh, so, Tim, tell us tell us about the layout of these. Are these the pastor's offices where counseling and and everything where they count the the tides and everything? Is that where this goes down? Yes, uh, I've seen a, a website that the church has used in the past that gave us kind of a little bit of a glimpse into those offices, and it's just like a secretary's desk, the pastor's office, the the assistant pastor or the youth pastor has an office, just a typical office with a computer and a calendar. And um, I think there's a bookcase in there. Um, yeah, just 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 kind of your typical. I think there might be a, a restroom in there um, as well. OK, so that whole wall there, 21, 20, 19, 18, uh, wh which of these off which of these rooms is not an office. Uh, I'm assuming, let me look at your schematic here. Um, so room 15 is actually a three to five year old classroom. Does right. that sound right? Yes. Okay. And then, then you've got room 16, east entrance to office rooms. What, what does that mean? That's oh, I see all the all door know. there. Okay. That's so I see a door there. About that end of uh that end of the hallway i just don't know a whole lot about um because the only view of it we have is from that far end down at the west okay so do we know if these offices do you have any information or knowledge if you can share and if you can't i totally understand i we certainly don't want to compromise anything going on uh, exactly. with, with missy's investigation we want to make sure we're capturing the right person here uh, without a doubt, but you know, I, I, I I'm curious as to uh, it's possible that it looks like room number 16. If this subject is on camera in additional angles, that video that has not been released, mm -hmm. it, it's still it's still in play that this suspect could have gone through these offices. Is that would that be an accurate statement and truthful? I believe so. Yes. Okay, so that that you know kind of puts uh, some other things you know into into thought process here, right? Uh, without speculation. So now across the hallway uh, or in front of room number twenty, I see a little uh, a circle. What explain what that circle is? Let me take a look at that. 
No problem. Perp stops at room 20. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I believe that room 20 is just a copier room. I think there's a Xerox copier in there. That's what I've been told. Okay. And it's connected to the office. I see a door there. Yes. And the main office is 19. Right. And there are, you know, multiple spaces within that area. Okay. So then let's go up to those arrows then across from that. Uh, break that down for us. Those arrows now going in the opposite direction. Yeah. I, I'm not sure how much you caught before my phone died earlier, but I was talking about the, uh, the video being out of sequence in my okay. estimation that mm -hmm. Uh, I think that when Midlothian police were editing this and preparing it to release, I think that they just put it in camera order rather than chronological okay. order. So, okay. so the camera that's pointing eastward down that hallway um, actually has two scenes. The one where the person is opening the Dutch door room and then proceeding further to the east and then when they mm -hmm. come back. And I think okay. that those were those were put sequentially one after another in the footage that was released to us. But I think chronologically, the suspect uh, continued on down the hallway and then up to the northeast. Mm -hmm. And then when they finished their perimeter tour, they turned around and came back. And then that's when that video of the... Uh, the suspect walking back toward the camera should be. So it should be at the very end of, of video instead of the next to last scene that we see. It's, it should be. Okay. The last. And what's the timestamp on that? There is know. no timestamp. The only timestamp we were given was a very short clip at the very beginning. And when Midlothian police released the two minute, 27 second longer video, uh, that was the last one that they released. They removed all timestamps from that. Okay, and that was 0350. 0350 was, was when the suspect emerged from the kitchen. Uh, 358 right. was when they were prying into room one and then going on to um, the Dutch door room at approximately 359, 4 o'clock. So everything that happened after 4 o'clock we just have to guess as far as the suspect's movements because we don't have a timestamp. Okay, so uh, let's answer a couple of questions here. And let me thank uh, Judy Welby. Thank you so much for your your, your kind uh, donation. And Sophia H., thank you. You're, you're so awesome. So let's go up to a couple of questions here. I've got one right here from Jojo. Uh, of, does it seem like the perpetrator knows she's inside and is making noises probably to scare her and see if there's anything for grabs at the time. What are your thoughts on that, Tim? Uh, you know, it, it's hard to get inside the mind of the suspect just from the footage that we know of. Um, I'll, I'll point out something that, you know, you can take it for what it's worth, but um, there was a, a foot, footage of a, a show called uh, Lies, Crimes, and Video on HLN that was released last year. And they interviewed a doctor who's a forensic podiatrist. He's a foot doctor. And he was brought mm -hmm. into this case to look at suspects or persons of interest and to look at the suspect in the video and kind of compare the gait and the way that they walk. And he said in one part of that video, and I've, I've got that 20 second clip on my YouTube channel, if you wanna go look at it. He said that he has seen footage that the public has not seen that shows Missy uh, entering the church and then she appears to hear something and then moves toward it. Um, now, since it, since it doesn't have sound on that video, I'm not sure how he can differentiate between her hearing something and seeing something, since whatever she's hearing or seeing is off camera. But he seems to think that she hears something. Okay. Okay, Emerald Eyes asked, have you ever seen burglars on, burglars on video where the perp takes his time like he has no care like this one? 
Uh, I got to tell you, in my my experience uh, in the environment for you know quite some time since 1982, to be exact. I don't want to age myself, but you know I just did. Uh, yes, uh, if if it's a if it's a confident suspect who knows what they're looking for or is in the discovery process, yeah, if if they don't have PD. Uh, at the door outside for, you know, alarm systems. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's very possible. Very, very possible. Uh, let's see here. Let me go to a couple more and then I want to get to the most important part here. And, and that's our, this beautiful mother of three, uh, Missy. And, and so I, let's do the, I'll do one more. Do you think the person was looking to rob uh, do you think the person was looking to rob the uh, church, uh, Nanamo? You know what? That That is a great question. And uh, we're still in the discovery process here uh, to kind of, you know, hopefully uh, get a little bit closer to those to that kind of answer. So um, let me get into now uh, Messi. So I've done a little victimology here. And I've done a little uh, research on, uh, you know, what her frame of mind was. And then I want to kind of correlate that to what we're seeing taking place inside of the building. Okay? But before I get there, uh, the timestamp of Missy coming into that building is what time does she pull up uh, under the, underneath that awning to unload? She pulls up to the awning at 416, according to what police have released. Okay, so at 350, okay, the suspect seen for the first time on video. At 416, the victim is seen for the first time on video. Is that accurate? Yes, 26 minutes later. Okay, so we have a 26 minute gap. Okay, and then she gets into the building at what's the next timestamp that we have? 418 is when she physically enters the church. Okay, so she's got two minutes underneath the awning. Uh, what is she doing in that time if we know? Uh, we know that she raises the cover of her uh, bed of her pickup truck. So she props that up, you know, unlocks the tailgate, brings the tailgate down, begins to unload some some fitness equipment and put it by the door. And she leaves her keys on the tailgate. So that's okay. what we know happened during that two minutes. OK, how does the how does the church door get open? She unlocks it with a key. And does she have a separate key or is it on her keychain left on the tailgate? We don't know for sure. I, I just, I assume that she probably kept that key on her keychain rather than something separate. Um, and that she pulled up, unlocked that door, and then went around to the back of the truck to begin unloading. Okay, so she, her, do we know what her habits were from anybody that spent time with her that early in the morning? Not really, because uh, she usually arrived before anyone else did. So okay. we, uh, we don't really know. Ahead. They they didn't get to see what she did before they got there. Okay. Joy Van asked, uh, did we know if, if she had a weapon? She did there, have a there's handgun. A that, yeah, Brandon had given her a handgun a few months before that, but it was uh -huh. stored in her truck and was not used. She did not take it with her. Okay, so there, it's possible that there's a gun inside the truck. Okay, um, and so I have I have a, a couple of questions, um, and let's talk. I want to talk about uh, Missy and and the type of woman that she is from just my observation. And I'm, you know, in all due respect for for her family, you know, I got to be honest with you. This woman is amazing. I mean, she is a mother of three. 
she's out there uh, just, you know, trying to encourage people, get people's lives organized. You know, she's she's in this boot camp mentality, this gladiator mentality. Now, let's think about that for a moment. OK, here's a woman with three kids. OK, and each of and she's dedicated to these children. I looked at her at, at her likes and I looked at some of her her post on her Facebook page. Uh, you know, she was heavily into that, uh, you know, her, her daughter and her sports, both of her daughters. Right. All three of them. But, you know, the oldest daughter and golf and a couple of other things going on there. And these are really important times uh, for this woman and this man her husband. Okay? A couple of days before this, she she puts out there prayers for her husband who's going into surgery. Uh, you know, this is this is a woman who is focused on her family and her career. Okay? But it's a different kind of focus. Her career focus is the mentality of a gladiator. And she's transferring that to her students. And she's learning it simultaneously by attending events like up in Austin, okay, where she's being empowered to empower other people. Okay? Uh, the, the day before this, you know, she was talking all about, you know, the amazing experience she had in Austin with Camp Gladiator and her daughters. OK, she was one tough cookie, smart, intelligent, strong, determined and focused. OK, now what does that tell us? Okay. That tells us if she walks into that building at approximately 420 a.m., okay, she has what we'll call situational awareness and high perceptive abilities. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is not a woman just walking into a church building, okay, looking to do, you know, an exercise class. Okay? This is a leader who's walking into a church building that one of the key indicators I think that is really important about her is if you go on her Facebook page, she's got pictures of Navy SEALs in buds. Okay. Now think about that. She's trying to correlate the thought process to her students about her thought process. Okay. So she's, she's saying to everybody, get in this mentality. Okay. Well, now let's measure that against suspectology. OK, uh, somebody who's, you know, just kind of malingering the, the hallways, allegedly. OK, and somebody who's breaking into different you know rooms with inside the building. And then all of a sudden you come up against a bear. Okay. Well, that's going to that's going to that's going to be really interesting to find out, you know, some other things that probably investigators are going to keep close to their chest in relationship to, you know, causes of death and manners of death. And folks, so this is why it's important for us just to be patient. Okay. We have to be patient here. Okay. Because this, if Missy uh, and my, my experience is going to tell me uh, if she ran into, if this suspect ran into her, okay, game on. Okay. Game on. She's just not going to say here, you know, let me, let me give, you know, take me. Okay. No, this is a problem. And that's why it could also be a problem for the suspect who did not anticipate a problem. Okay. So that could lean one of two ways. Okay. If the suspect's looking to hunt somebody, okay, uh, you certainly don't bring a hammer and a chisel, okay, to hunt. Those are tools to break into a building, okay? That, that's, that's important to understand, okay? Because 
if the suspect was on the hunt, okay, then there's got to be some other indicators that I, I think we need a little more information about. And, and this tonight's probably not the place to get it yet, just yet. Okay. But at some point, I'm sure we're all going to cross that bridge. Okay. With that said, correct me if I'm in any way, shape, or form in the last five years, uh, you've been studying uh, this situation. Uh, if I'm in left field, go ahead and, and put me back in right field. So go ahead. <laughs> Tim, no, I, I, I mean every, everything you said is is right on, um, and uh, and and let me just say this about Missy, you know, just to add on to what you said about her as a person, you know, everything about Missy was about giving to other people. Um, mm -hmm. She was a special ed teacher, so she was working with kids who had special needs, and then she transitioned from that to staying home with her kids so that they could be homeschooled until they got older. And then as they got older, she then worked on transforming her body so that she could then work with other people to transform their lives. So just uh, someone who always gave of herself to other people. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a, this is a tragedy through and through. Okay. And and you can bet this suspect uh, has been paying attention to all the media. Okay, uh, I interviewed a guy years ago on death row. His name was Wesley Allen Dodd. Uh, I'm going to do a I, I'm going to do a case on him uh, uh, pretty soon. And I spent six hours with Dodd getting into his head. And just I was the last interview before uh, he was executed at Walla Walla State Prison in Washington State. Uh, the one thing that Dodd was very particular on, he says, you know, one of the biggest mistakes you guys make as cops uh, and detectives is you always go on the news and you talk about it. Okay. Well, Dodd made a living out of kidnapping children and then subsequently taking their lives. And he told me one, one, uh, one time that he went back to his hotel room with this one victim. And you know the first thing he did, Tim? He what turned the TV on. He turned the TV on okay, to see what the sheriff was going to say about looking for this kid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, that during the press conference, they related there was some information that they were searching over here, searching over there. So what did Dodd do in his mindset? He went the opposite direction of where the investigation was heading. Okay. So let me say this to who's ever watching tonight. Okay? Okay? They know. They just don't know, you know, all of it yet. Okay? But when you have almost 500 people watching us tonight, that's going to multiply to 5,000, then 10,000, then 20,000. Okay? The one thing you did not anticipate is the power of social media. Okay? Guys like Tim, who spent five years of his life, you know, looking in for justice for Missy, okay? All of her classmates, all of her friends, okay? All of the police, all of the investigators, all of the DAs, all of her family, okay? They are committed to finding you, okay? And they're going to, okay? So, you know, you've made a lot of mistakes. I got to be honest with you. I'm not going to break them down tonight. Okay? But who, whoever you are, you've made some mistakes. Okay? And uh, I'll point them out as time goes on here. Uh, but I guarantee you, uh, this individual uh, will be caught at some point. Uh, at some point. There, there's, there's a whole lot going on here. So we know at 420... Uh, we don't have the the time of death because that's too personal for YouTube personally right now. Okay, we don't have access to the autopsy reports. Correct. Correct. Those are sealed. Okay. And the and but you have done an extensive uh, job of pulling some search warrants. They were looking at a former cop guy uh, at uh, you know uh, another agency that got fired. 
they flushed him through the ringer. They may still be focused on him. We don't know. Okay, but it sounds like they kicked him out the back doors. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yeah, they say that they cleared him and that he had nothing to do with it. So unless they're okay. just flat they, out misdirecting on that, then I think he's in the clear. Okay. And the father-in-law, I guess he was in California, in Oceanside, California, uh, golfing. Is that right? Okay. That's correct. He and his wife were on vacation in an RV. Kind yeah, like and you know that dream. you know that was my agency, Oceanside. So that well, when, I know when you when you first called me, Oceanside popped up on the caller ID, and I was like, "Wow, yeah. that's that's where yeah. Randy was." <laughs> yeah, welcome to welcome to coincidence, right? The universe is on schedule, as I like to yes. say. Okay, and all of the that evidence has been tested; it's been flushed out as belonging to animal from their from the dog that died and all that stuff. So. I, and the husband, you know, Randy, I mean, he's, you know, that that poor guy is just trying to keep focused on his daughters and and hope that the investigation is continuing to move forward. And, and the investigation is moving, isn't it, Tim? Yes. Without really details. Uh, uh, yeah, w w without details, because we certainly don't want to get in the way of anything that Midlothian police are doing. But yeah, um, no. although, although there might have been, you know, some inexperience in the beginning with homicide in that department and, and how to investigate homicides simply because they never had them <laughs> in Midlothian, um, they have uh, they brought in some people into the department who do have homicide experience. And um, okay. so they're it's very much an active investigation. It is not a cold case. Uh, they're not just okay. sitting around twiddling their thumbs, waiting for someone to call and say, I did it. They're uh, they're definitely in an active investigatory mode. Yeah. And, and what that means to me in stealth terminology, OK, is, you know, they've got some target acquisition and they're still flushing uh, through, you know, some some particular problems. So if if you're watching uh, you better look over your back, whoever you are, uh, because they're coming. And uh, I think it's going to be an interesting day. It's going to be an interesting day. So let's now, Dylan, let's tee up the video in sequence. Uh, let's tee up the video in sequence uh, that uh, Tim put together on his channel. And by the way, I'm talking to Tim Kovo tonight, guys. If you've had not, a, if you've not had a chance. Get over to his YouTube site. It's called Gumshoe Stories. And he has dedicated the last five years to finding justice for, for Missy. And, and I, I got to, I think this is just the start for you, buddy, because you have one of those minds that uh, is very good at connecting dots. He's got all the search warrants over there. Uh, he's got a lot of videos up there. And we got to get him to over a thousand subscribers. Uh, if, if you haven't had a chance, get over there, subscribe to his channel. And and also, you know, there it is right there. Miss Sophia, thank you so much for putting his channel in there. OK, so, Tim, this is your can I can I play this uh, with your permission? This is from Absolutely. your channel. OK, yeah, you so play anything. OK, so this is the video in sequence. So let, let's walk us through this here. Um, Walk us through what, yeah. what we've got going here. Go ahead. Okay. And, and and until we get to the last two sequences, it'll be matching what Midlothian originally released. Uh, we have the suspect. You saw them emerge from door eight briefly and start walking down the hallway with their hand kind of sliding down the wall. Now they're on the western hallway, uh, kind of proceeding southward. And this is where they're in front of that door that is a janitorial closet containing cleaning supplies and they're taking a pry bar from their vest and using it in conjunction with the hammer to try to pry open this door and the video kind of pauses and jumps a little bit maybe the motion activation might be um, a little off here now they give up and they walk in front of the camera, and then they're proceeding down the the southern hallway going toward the east, and there's the Dutch door, which is room 21, opening the bottom 
kind of being surprised by that and looking at the top door and opening it and then proceeding away from the camera. Room 20 would be next with the copier, so they probably didn't spend much time there. 19 is the offices. Um, and then and then this is where they're in room 10. So we don't have footage of them proceeding up that eastern hallway. Not that has been released to us anyway. But this is at the far northeast where they're emerging from room 10. And what they're doing is they're hammering out the vertical window of room 9, which is a storage room directly across. And then they come back. They double back. And now they are about to take a right into the auditorium. And that's where the video ends. So, okay, so in my, in my mind, chronologically, that, that's what it should be. And so the last known location uh, that we have for the suspect would be when they enter that auditorium. So it would be an accurate statement to say that this suspect hit the north, the south, the east, and the west side of this building. Yes, in clockwise fashion. Okay, so if he came I'm sorry, out on room eight, not clock, counterclockwise. counterclockwise. Yes. Right. Yeah, he's because yeah, he's coming out of room eight and he's headed in a westerly direction around the building. Is that Until correct? He gets to room ten, and room ten completes the circuit of those exterior rooms. You know, what they're doing is they're just focusing on those exterior rooms as they go. And then okay. they come back and um, focus their attention on the interior rooms, which there aren't that many. But there's like room nine, which we see them breaking into. And then there's room 14 down at the other end of that hallway. And then they come around to the auditorium. So is room 14 also... Way of I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I didn't mean to step. I didn't mean to step over. Is 14 broken into as well? I don't know if it was locked. Um, I don't know anything about that room other than I believe that's where their praise and worship team met uh, because it's like right off the stage, and so it might have been a gathering place for them before they started a service. Uh, room nine had folding tables and old projectors and things like that in it because I've actually seen a photo of room nine but I'm not sure about 14. So there's broken glass that they broke he he the the perpetrator broke the glass to room number nine. Correct. So he's pounding uh at that end side of the building. What's the time stamp on that? Do not have know. time stamp. No, we okay. do not know. Has, have you found anything in the search warrants that would have given us a uh, close timestamp on that? No, search warrants do not mention any timestamps. Okay. Okay. And, and, and guys, just to remind you, when you go over to Tim's YouTube page, go to his about side. At the very bottom, it says my website. Hit that website. Uh, there's a wealth of information there for you. OK, and I'm sure, you know, and Tim's even got his email. He'd love to talk to you and give give his insight. So out of these 15 rooms, OK, not counting the worship center yet. Okay, do we know if the suspect makes it into the worship center? Yes, because what you see at the very end of that video that you just played when they come yes. back toward the camera and then they make a right. That is the worship center that they're going into. Okay, so we don't know now. Now we do know it's 26 minutes before Missy walks into that building. So in that 26 yeah. minutes, right? In that 26 minutes, this suspect has made a complete circle around that building potentially, broken multiple multiple doors to get in. Okay, and and then at some point makes their way into the worship center, okay? Right. Uh, Darlene put, says, I think the person looks like a woman. Uh, she's been there before and now looking for Missy, confusing. Uh, you know, great. Thank you for that, uh, that kind donation. But uh, 
Yeah, I mean, everything's on the table right now. Everything's on the table. Great observation. Love I the one thing the one thing I absolutely love, Tim, is is people have they have thoughts, they have ideas. And that's how cases get solved. Go ahead. That's right. And 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 you know, going back to that outfit and and, and the possibility of the suspect being a woman, you know, just trying to see things from all sides here. You know, people do ask the question, why would someone dress up in all that gear to rob a church? Well, if they're a woman and they don't want anyone on camera to see that they're a woman, what better outfit to put on than a police SWAT riot gear type outfit? Because nothing about that gear in our minds in the stereotype would say that's a woman. So, so if a woman okay, wanted let's, to let's... appear to be a man, then that would be something that she might do. Okay, so and let's think a little bit deeper into that. Okay, okay. Why a SWAT? Why a SWAT? Why a SWAT persona? Who's your victim? A female. A gladiator. A gladiator. Right. Okay. So remember, we got to talk about what the victim is about in order to understand the hunter you have to understand the deer okay mm -hmm. so if you have a deer with a rack okay that is going to come down and come at you okay, then you had better be thinking potentially okay of having a persona that says well i can handle that rack coming at me okay so these are some of the behavioral analysis thought process that maybe people aren't even thinking about yet. Okay. So if it's a female, okay, and they're using this as a persona because they know they're coming into a gladiator, uh, you know, arena. And, and thank you, Mimi. Um, let me get your uh, question here before, before it gets away here. Oh, you're awesome. You're so kind. Boy, you're great. She says you're awesome. There she is. Thank you, Mimi J2. Um, but now you think about this, you know, entering into the gladiator arena, arena. Okay. I don't know. You know, it, it, it could also be a, a guy. Okay. Who's just not living up to the gladiator. And he's projecting, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big dude here. Okay, I'm more important than than what you think here. Okay, so right now, you know, it can go either way. It can go either way. Okay, um, so one, but I want to break down this time frame with with Missy coming through the door now, and where where this suspect possibly could be, because I know that the crime scene is where. Tell, remind me where the crime scene is. Well, the crime scene has not been disclosed. That's one of those things that police uh, are oh, okay. holding close to the vest. Um, you know, there, there's one public record out there that's a CSI report from Ellis County where the CSI tech sort of describes in his report where he was led to, but he uses some pretty vague language. Um, but what I gather from it, and I'm not really that confident in it is that that west main entrance foyer somewhere mm -hmm. around that area could be where the attack happened or could be where missy ended up or both but like i say that's okay. not something we can say definitively um, police said in the beginning that she was found at the southwest corner of the interior of the building but um, it, it's hard to reconcile that because if she was okay. at the southwest corner of the interior of the building, the campers who were gathering outside under the awning would have been able to see her body. And we know that they didn't because they didn't call 911 until five o'clock when they entered the church and went and found her. And which, which entrance did they come in? Through the same entrance that Missy went through, the southwest awning entrance. Okay, so there's there's a little awning there between the men's and the women's room. Is that correct? Is that like a hallway down there? No, no, no. That's very shallow. You you walk okay. in the entrance way. You look to your left, and you've got 
a men's room and a women's room, but there's a wall right there. It's just, it's just a matter of a few feet in deppth. Okay. Uh, Elbaya no says, okay. Uh, she says, I believe it's simpler uh, than that's what uniform was to divert a civilian walk in and saw him. He had uh, to make them believe he was a cop. Uh, I mean, yeah, that could, that could possibly be absolutely. That could be, that could be possible. And thank you so much for that kind of, uh, donation that uh, is very considerate of you. Grateful. Um, you know, but now w here we are now. And do we, do you have any sense of where the suspect is when Missy's coming through that door? Do you have any idea of that, that you can divulge? I, I don't know. I mean, I can only speculate. And the speculation okay, what's your speculation? is just based on, yeah, the speculation based upon police saying that she entered and walked up the hallway toward where the suspect was located. That's what they said in their, some of their search warrants. Uh, I can only assume that the suspect was uh, either in the auditorium or was in the, the West main uh, foyer. Uh, because you could be in that area and that, that's a pretty deep area. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be visible from the hallway. So, so if the that, suspect, mm -hmm, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe he was in the auditorium. That was the last place we saw him chronologically in the footage. Um, but there's just, there's no way to know. There's no way to know exactly what the interaction was there. Did they see each other from a distance? Did she come around a corner and he came around a corner and it was like the, you know, the Reese's peanut butter commercial where the two people run into each other, you know, did it happen like that? Um, you know, or did, she, or did she see him from a distance and turn around and start to run and, and he chased her down. And I say, he, I don't, I don't know whether it's a man or a woman, obviously, but um, yeah, we just don't know what the nature of that interaction was. We can only guess. Okay. So if the suspect goes, we do know the suspect went into the worship center. Yes. And how do we know that? Because at the end of that video footage of, of my edit that you played, yep. they come back toward the camera, they turn toward their right, and that's where they go. That door okay. is an entrance into the auditorium. And is this other, is there an exit out of that worship center along the west side? Yes. There's, there's right. multiple doors. I, I believe there's at least two uh, entrance exit doors uh, on the west side. Is that the one straight, straight across from room number two? That Are those double doors? Uh, yeah. So, yeah those are okay, so hypothetically, if a suspect's in the worship center and he or she gets spooked of hearing somebody come through the covered porch door at 28 minutes into this and emerges into that hallway, uh, the southeast or southwest entrance hallway, there could have been a point of contact, what we call the contact site. Okay. And if that was the case, then the choice of weapons will become critical. And I don't want to talk about those tonight or speculate. That's up to the PD. Uh, they know what the choice of weapons is, but it will also give us a better mindset of what the suspects are thinking and why they would choose uh, certain types of weapons. There's a lot of speculation. We ha I haven't seen the autopsy report. Uh, I'm not going to guess. Okay. All the only thing I saw was that hammer. And I got to be honest with you, in one of the videos, if you freeze frame it, when the suspect drops it down by where, where the suspect's hitting, uh, you know, uh, along that door there with the pry bar, okay, it looked almost like a roofing hammer with a spiked edge at the other side of it, okay? The, I've, seen, I've seen those kind of hammers. Uh, I've seen them used, okay? And I've seen them, you know, in a variety of different things. Uh, 
Uh, so I don't know if that's weapon. It's, you know, that's not for me as it, at this point, uh, the, the, the PD knows and uh, so uh, that'll be good. Uh, Tim, what else do you want to add uh, for our viewers here tonight? And uh, by the way, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for all the work that you've put into this on behalf of this family. You know, God bless you. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, you've been communicating uh, with, you know, some folks with the family. And uh, you know what? You're a good man, uh, you know, for what you're doing. Uh, stay the course. Uh, so tell us what else we should learn and know to get the speculation out of the wind. Uh, we've got, you know, 500 and something people here right now, and it's going to keep building. So help us understand what you know not to be true. And it's just rumor, speculation, and we need to nip it uh, before it gets out of control even further. Okay. Yeah. Chris, as far as what, what I know or really believe not to be true, um, I don't believe that Midlothian police had any corruption involved in this case. There were some some characters early on who, who were on the internet um, sleuthing around and sort of creating chaos with speculations and conspiracy theories that certain um, members of the department of the Midlothian Police Department were, um, you know, were not acting truthfully and were maybe involved in Missy's death. And there's just no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, Midlothian police might be criticized for their lack of experience or, um, you know, maybe other things related to that, but they, they've, they've had good intentions and uh, I think they've done the best they can. And I don't see any reason to um, accuse any Midlothian police department personnel of, of, of anything criminal. I think that they all want to see this case solved and they're doing their job as public servants to try to make that happen. Um, the original target list of nine or so names, which included family members, which included some friends and some Camp Gladiator co-workers of Missy's, those people were all cleared of suspicion, according to police. They're no longer focus of the investigation. They're no longer persons of interest. There's one or two people on that list that some people want to continue to cast suspicion on. And I can tell you that police are not suspicious of those people, so neither should we be. There's just no reason to be. If police tell us that there's a reason, then that's a different story. But what they've told us unequivocally is that no one in that circle of Missy's family, friends, and coworkers is a suspect. So we can put that to bed, hopefully, and move on to, you know, what I think is just the critical thing of finding out why that person was there in the church, um, whether it was a burglary, whether they were there to target Missy, that's really the critical thing to solve in this. And, um, and then beyond that, Chris, I'm just, I'm glad that you're covering the case and, and offering your insight. And uh, for, I'd say four years, this case was very underreported. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why that was, uh, it was frustrating. Um, the local media there in DFW, I think, were responsible for some of that by just not taking the ball and running with it and uh, mm -hmm. being, you know, less than proactive. You know, they were just waiting for police to tell them that they had something to say. Um, but I think the, I think that the tide has turned a little bit. We've seen a lot more coverage of this case, particularly in podcasts. And um, that's that's been really gratifying to see. Um, the main thing is um, we want to hold people accountable when they do cover this case in a podcast. So if they get information wrong, which is easy to do, even if you do hours and hours of research, um, I think it's important to try to keep the train on the track as to what the real information is. So I just hope that as we move forward that we'll all... Um, hold each other accountable and keep everything straight and then just keep praying and working for a solution uh, and a resolution to this case. 
Yeah. Do you think it will be solved? One of the questions. The only way I think it won't be solved is if this truly were someone with no connection to Missy and if that person is successful and never talking about it. And if there's no DNA, if the, those things are all true, then it's going to be very difficult because what you saw with BTK is he didn't talk to anybody until he talked to police and sent them some taunting letters. And, and then he got caught. The Golden State Killer never talked to anybody. Um, so, you know, if you don't have physical evidence, if you don't have DNA, and if you have someone who just really does not tell any friends, any family members, and they keep that secret with them, then it is going to be very hard to solve. But then again, it may not be someone who's disconnected from Missy. It may be someone who did have a connection of some kind. And maybe there's someone out there who knows something and they just need to, to come forward and share with police. So here's a couple of questions coming in. Um, was there anything stolen from the church? And the other one was, did they have a safe? And thank you, Zoe. Um, I mean, I don't know if a, if a safe existed in the church, but I do know that the church did not store their Sunday tithes and offerings in a safe. They immediately left the church after services and went and took that uh, money to the bank and deposited it. So there wouldn't have been anything of value, but a burglar wouldn't have necessarily known that. So they may have been looking for the place where tithes and offerings might be. Yeah, no, this was interesting. Um, and um, what, one of the other things also, yes, uh, they they would have searched uh, the dumpsters, uh, I'm sure of that, uh, as well as did this, why the suspect leave the doors open, uh, you know, because uh, they just want to get, you know, to the next one. Uh, they're, you know, they're typically they won't close the door right behind them. So um, it'd be a waste of energy. Uh, yeah, waste of energy. Good point. And, and by the way, the other thing about Tim that you don't know about and is uh, he's got a journalistic uh, side to him. You know, you study journalism, right, Tim, if I remember right? Yes, I have a journalism degree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I've never, That's what I've makes never you dangerous. Crimes. It was mostly sports <laughs> journalism and uh, mostly uh, writing technical manuals in my previous lives. Um, so, yeah, true crime is not something I've brought my journalism background to other than interviewing people and, you know, establishing sources and understanding that when you want to verify something, you don't go on one source. You get two independent sources to to confirm something. So, yeah, I did. I did learn in, in college a few things that have, have helped me out in investigating this case. Awesome. Uh, Sharon says uh, he's killed many times before. Well, we appreciate that, uh, your opinion there, uh, Sharon, and thank you for sharing that for sure. Uh, does the, this question here, does the, does it give the perp cover also uh, to leave the doors open? Thank you. Um, you know that, yeah, it could. Absolutely. That's a great point, Sister325. Uh, that's, a, that's a, a great point. So let me, let me throw a couple more of these up here. Uh, thank you, Maj. Uh, we absolutely just think you're fantastic. You are the greatest. You are the greatest. Um, well, you know what, Tim, can you think of anything that, uh, I should have asked you that you feel was important that, uh, we'd like to get out here? One thing quick, I'd like to ask you and get your input on that's kind of interesting. You know, we've talked a lot about the Nissan Altima at uh, the mm -hmm. SWFA parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, at the three-year anniversary, the uh, the police released a press release kind of giving an update on the case, and they brought up the Altima, but then they also brought up uh, an Infiniti G37, and they said that the car seen at the SWFA might be uh, a Nissan Altima or an Infiniti G37. So that Infiniti okay. kind of came out of nowhere, and it's kind of hard to imagine that 
in three years of looking at that video that they would just all of a sudden come, come up with, well, it's maybe it's not the Altima, maybe it is an Infiniti. And hey, I've looked at the hoods of both of those cars, and it's pretty clearly not an Infiniti. So I just wanted to get your input on why you think police would have thrown that out about an Infiniti at the three-year mark. Um, you know, quite frankly, it could be a mistake. And they were, you know, they're thinking, you know, okay, is, is it a possibility? And so what happens behind the scenes is you have these round tables, okay, where everybody, you know, circles up is what we used to call it. And, you know, you sit there and you decide, okay, what is something the suspect knows that we want him or her to know that we know? Okay. And then the second is, if we release this information into the public, okay, will it cause a cascading effect of destruction of evidence and or, uh, you know, uh, it creates more problems than it solves? Okay. So one of the questions that was probably on the table for the investigators, it, to your point, is, is it an Ultima? Is it, you know, an infinity? OK. Um, and so somebody made a decision initially uh, to go with the Ultima. OK, say, well, you know, let's not confuse folks. Let's go with what we think it is at this point okay? and let's put it out there. OK, and that's probably where uh, that came from. Okay? Now, three years down the road, they've run into potentially a dead end and or they have a different different information, a, a tip or something that comes through the door and says, hey, you know, well, you guys have been looking for an Alta, Ultima all this time. It, it's actually an infinity. OK, now you now have to make a choice as a case agent. And most good investigators will eat that crow pretty quickly because they're focused on discovery of the truth for the victim okay and they put it out there and they don't say hey i made a mistake okay they just say hey by the way this could be this uh, another type of vehicle so it could go both ways it might not necessarily be a mistake it might be they're trying to get that information in the suspect's head okay that we're getting closer to you we now know your car Okay, that's a possibility. I have not eliminated that car yet from this particular crime personally, just on my own observations. Okay, I've not, I, I heard that there was a vehicle that left, you know, around four something in the morning. It was a dark colored SUV. Okay, and that guy, the former cop, uh, you know, in the other town over there that they went, you know, and locked him up. Uh, for some violations. And by the way, that guy, that guy was dirty on a couple other things, you know, just outside of this case, he had his own problems. Okay. So yeah, it's a good thing they got him in jail. Okay. But, you know, he had a dark colored SUV. He had access to all these other things. I read your search warrants and the affidavits that went with them. Okay. So they had to check the box on that guy. Okay. Potentially. Okay. Or keep him in the circle, as we used to say. OK, and so you want to kind of keep that guy in the circle. And, and and even though they say, yeah, he's been, you know, he's been kicked out of the circle. OK, he's still in the game. OK, uh, it's like it's like baseball. OK, uh, yeah, you know, strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. OK, but there's another inning. Okay? If something changes in an investigation. The one thing about homicide that, you know, you learn pretty quickly, it is never the way it appears, ever. Okay? There are so many moving parts and so many circumstances, okay, that the one thing you don't want to get into is this tunnel vision and go down all these rabbit holes. Okay? So, one, so part of that is having an open mind about all possibilities. So three years ago, 
maybe there's a new fresh set of eyes that went on this investigation. I know this is a long answer, but I'm just kind of giving you the way these guys are probably thinking. Okay. Somebody came into the room and said, Hey, could this be an infinity? Okay. And everybody looked around and went, I don't know. Okay. Let's, let's do a little math here. And so they probably sent it to the FBI. Uh, you know, the FBI has every single make and model of every car ever made, meaning they they have books and and pictures and, you know, fenders and, you know, right down to the light bulbs uh, in the cars. Okay, so they probably sent it back to the lab and somebody in the lab in, in D.C., okay, in Quantico said, hey, uh, you know, you guys ever thought about an infinity? And then sent that back downstream. Okay. Uh, so that I hope that answers your question and, and helps you. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Um, everybody, everybody's caught on this guy's walk or this gal's walk. Uh, I, I love this. Okay. And that's tunnel vision. Okay. Remember when I started the first video at the store, okay, where did I say I was going to start? So I was going to start at the store okay, with the suspect pulling into the parking lot, turning their lights off. Okay. Well, why do you do that? Okay. And, you know, the, the walk becomes secondary through the course of understanding the other potential behaviors. Okay. And so it, it's a very distinctive walk. There's no question about that. They've had experts weigh in. OK, they've they've compared that walk to family members. Uh, they've compared that walk to, you know, uh, veterans. I mean, there's all kinds of people that have that duck walk. OK, but there's only one that had that walk with Missy. Okay. But how do we know it's not an act? I don't know. OK, that's a good so, point. You know, you know, I don't know if you remember the the Rob Lamone case who uh, was murdered by his uh, wife's lover. Um, the lover actually faked a limp and uh, doctored up his motorcycle so that his motorcycle would look different and, and then went to the husband's place of work and knowing he was going to be on camera, he faked a limp. So there's precedent for somebody faking a certain type of walk. Yeah, I mean, if all the experts weigh in, uh, which, you know, I don't have enough information about that. If they all weigh in and say, yes, okay, this, you know, this is why A, B, C, and D, you know, to your video, you know, a while ago, okay, then, yeah, I'm going to go with that guy. Okay? I mean, that's what they do. And that's what they're trained to do. Okay? I'm not trained to, you know, figure out why the guy, you know, walks that way. Okay. I, I just want to know, you know, why they took Missy's life. Okay? And, and, and you get to that in the interview room. Okay. That, I mean, literally, I've, I've, I would have let, you know, I had a guy shoot a guy in the head one time for a red hat, if you can believe that. Okay. Just a horrific crime. It's a, a guy, a father of three, playing baseball with his son, and a gangbanger walked up on him who was a crip, and they, they liked the color blue in Southern California anyway. And this guy was wearing a red baseball cap and shot him. Okay. I got him in the interview room and I asked him, I said, why in the world did you do that? Quote, I didn't like his hat. Okay. So that was the motive. So we can speculate all day long about, you know, why somebody would kill a father of three on a baseball field, okay, when the suspect's only thinking, well, I just don't like the color red. So yeah. the human spirit well, you know, is that, capable. Go. That, that brings up an interesting point that, that I would like to make. You know, it is easy for a lot of people to try to assign common sense ideas to the way that this suspect might think. I've heard people say so many times that, well, if that suspect wasn't there to kill Missy, then he wouldn't have killed Missy because he would have thought, well, 
you know, I, I could get the death penalty for this. And, uh, and, and he would have, you know, maybe hit her or whatever, but he would have left because he could have gotten away rather than kill her. And that's, that's faulty logic because, you know, you don't, you don't make time stand still when you are a criminal who's broken into a building and you're suddenly um, encountering someone that you didn't expect to. Um, you don't go through some mental checklist of what the Texas statute is for the death penalty and then make a decision about what you're going to do. It's just like when someone is mugging somebody and they end up shooting and killing them or somebody's um uh, holding up a liquor store and they end up shooting the clerk. It happens, you know, and you don't, you can't expect a criminal to do the right thing because they already started out doing the wrong thing. They've already kind of set uh, an agenda that they're, they're not making good decisions already. Right. So, yeah. um, so I just, I, I kind of chuckle every time s somebody seems to think that the criminal is going to do the common sense thing. Yeah. No, yeah, great point. That's a very valid point. I appreciate your insight there. And uh, AK says, uh, hey, Chris, Tim, is there technology available as just a license plate recognition? What about criminals in the area with a vehicle similar? You know, uh, AK, thank you, first of all, for that, that kind uh, consideration and donation. I'm grateful for that. Uh, there is technology uh, available. It's called LPR. Okay, it's license plate recognition technology. Uh, there's a couple of companies across the country that do it. Uh, but the problem is in this particular situation is the lighting and the rain and a variety of other things that were taking place there. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I think if they would have had this license plate up by now, uh, they would have been kicking in some doors uh, and this suspect would be in custody. I, uh, here's a quick one. This is an interesting one. JRS, JRS says, Chris, it'd be interesting to take a poll right now, male or female. So let's do that. Okay. Uh, one for male, two for female. So let's take that poll just out of curiosity. And uh, I'll throw that up also on, uh, on my uh, community page. And Tim, maybe you can do the same over on yours, uh, on your YouTube page and uh, see what, uh, you know, what folks are weighing in here. Um, okay. What about satellite images? Yeah, you know, great, great point. Uh, there are some companies uh, that can do that. Uh, I don't know if those resources have been exhausted. Um, you know, personally, I don't have that information. Tim, do you? I don't really know much about satellite imagery. Okay. I, I know they did it in Delphi, or excuse me, in, yeah, in Delphi and a couple others. Um, I, I won't tell you why I know that, but I know that they did. Okay. Uh, looks, we got a lot of ones here. A lot of ones. So we got, we've got a couple of twos. One <laughs> Maui girl. There's an, there's an investigator for you. Maui girl, way to go. One and two. <laughs> After Rowan, uh, Rowan to you. Uh, oh, she's just clapping. You guys are the best. Um, so Tim, uh, you know, you're the best, man. Oh, you know, one of the things on the sticker on the back of the car, somebody said it looked like a Georgia Bulldog sticker, uh, a round sticker. You you want to comment about the sticker on the back of the the back of the car, Tim? I know so you I've, talked I've about that. I've got opinions about the sticker. I will give you my opinion about the sticker. Uh, and my is this is your opinion or this is the <laughs> – I'm teasing. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my opinion is there is no sticker. And that what appears on the bumper of that car, and the only time it appears is when the car is all the way out at the road waiting to turn onto the highway. In the center is a shadow, an oval shadow, and I believe that it is the shadow or reflection of the SWFA lighted sign, which is on the side of the building, um, which is oval. So, you know, if, if you break frame by frame, that last sequence when the car is moving toward the highway, there, you know, there is no bumper sticker. If you look at any of that video, the only time it even looks like there might be one is when that car is about to turn onto the highway. So there's no bumper sticker. And, and yet police, I heard uh, the former assistant police chief, Kevin Johnson, he was on a show that I also guested on that was on investigation discovery called still a mystery. 
They interviewed him and he repeated it at the four year mark saying that there was a bumper sticker on that car. And that just blows my mind because there's not one. If there is, I'll eat it. I mean, peel it off and I will eat it. If you can prove to me that there was a. Do you want salt on that? On just in car. case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring the shaker. I'm going to bring the salt shaker. shaker. Okay, so uh, Anissa says here, let's do a one she knew the perp, two total stranger burglar gone wrong. Okay, so let's pull that up here. One, she knew the perp, two uh, burglary stranger gone wrong. Okay, while they're doing that, uh, I have some updates on some of the other cases, Tim, while you're here. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful for you being here tonight and everything that you've shared with us. Hey, you're a good man. Keep going. Hey, don't don't give up. Miss, Missy deserves it. And uh, if I can help in any way, shape, or form that family through the Cold Case Foundation or anything that I have resources to, you please reach out to us. Uh, we've been more than glad uh, to assist Okay, and to help. It has to come from the agency and or the family. Uh, the foundation is a 501, you know, C3. Um, so a couple of updates. Uh, Barry Morphew changed his phone number, everybody. Okay. But guess who is uh, on that track? So Barry, you know, expect a call. I'm coming. Okay. On that particular phone. Okay. That's number one. Number two, Larry uh, with, with Maya down there. Poor Maya. Okay. Larry, you've got some explaining to do. Okay. There's a problem down there. And uh, we're going to, we're going to be doing some follow-up uh, with that situation. Uh, but the PD knows what time it is and uh, you need to look over your shoulder. Okay. Things are coming to, uh, going to get pretty interesting here. Uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Brennan, uh, Eddie, uh, when you get a chance, give me a call. Okay? I want to talk to you a little bit more about some information that I've discovered. So uh, when we get a chance, uh, let's hook up and let's communicate with each other. Okay, shall we? Um, you know, it's interesting. We've got these poor women, with the with the exception of Missy, uh, and thousands of them who just disappear. And then there's these women who are with their loving husbands, supposedly. And then they disappear. Okay. So next Sunday, this Sunday night, I'm going to break down uh, the eight, eight ways and processes of domestic homicide. Okay. And and there's a pattern. There are eight pattern. There are eight steps to this pattern. So don't miss Sunday night. We're going to break it down. We're going to get into the mind of those individuals. I'm going to, uh, I, I had a case, uh, her name was uh, Romeres, uh, and uh, I'm going to show you some things uh, about how these guys are processing uh, and how uh, ultimately it ended up. Be patient. Be patient uh, as a community. Stay diligent. Uh, be kind to each other. You know, our mods here tonight, thank you so much for everything that you've done, that you continue to do. Stay diligent for these victims, guys and gals. If we stay diligent to these victims and for these victims, that some point justice will be served. And so with that, get over to Tim's uh, YouTube page uh, and subscribe. Tim, what's the name of your page again? Gumshoe Stories. Gumshoe Stories. And when you go to the About page, go down to the bottom. He's got his uh, website there. Uh, get into that. Man, he's got some great stuff on Missy. Tim, thank you so much for coming tonight and being, I've made a good friend here. And I'm grateful for everything that you're doing again. Uh, with that, Dylan, thank you for everything. Thank you for everybody who shared your thoughts and your ideas. Um, and uh, Dylan, let's go. Take us out. See you on Sunday. Hard working every day. I'm stressed out 24 7, babe. No, no time outs. Wish we could fly away. You and I go to our favorite.
favorite place Oh yeah, yeah Make special memories 